All right, welcome to all of our DAYL members. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'll go over a couple of little logistical things while we're waiting on people to, to get into the room. Uh, if this is your first time joining us for a DAYL CLE, you should know that we're a self-reporting CLE. So what that means is that towards the end of the presentation, our executive director, the incomparable Sherry Harris, will put the CLE code in the chat um, you're responsible on your own your own end for taking that code and uh, updating it with your State Bar of Texas CLE profile. Uh, uh, we, we, I think we got a good number of people in here, so we can go ahead and go, get started. Thank you guys so much for being here. My name is Jay Spring. I'm an associate at Ryan Law Firm and a co-chair of the DAYL CLE committee. Um, and I am honored today to have the chance to sit down with three uh, three incredibly accomplished, um, phenomenal attorneys and mentors of mine. Thank you guys so much for being here, Monica, Barry, and Corey. Um, to, to briefly introduce our panel, Monica Latin is the managing partner at Carrington Coleman, one of the, uh, the most well-known, well-established top litigation, civil litigation firms in the city of Dallas. Uh, Mr. Barry Sorrell's needs no introduction. He was the DAYL past president, the DBA past president, uh, the founding partner of Sorrell's Ola, and uh, one of the top criminal litigators in the city of Dallas and the state of Texas. And then Mr. Corey Ryan is the founder of the international tax litigation boutique firm, Ryan Law Firm PLLC. Um, in his time, he's overseen the growth of that firm from a local Dallas firm to expand across the US and Canada. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I'm so excited to have the chance to get to talk with y'all um, about what I think is one of the most important issues uh, in a young attorney's career, which is autonomy. Um, it's the idea of making sure that your law practice isn't something that happens to you, but something that you build. Um, and so we're here to, to discuss how to be, as we say, the CEO of your career. To kick us off, I'd, I'd like to talk about um, being intentional in building a law practice. And to, to do that, I think the best way is to, to go straight to the horse's mouth and get the experience and the background and how you guys built your practices, what you did, and what the, those major moments were that built you to where you are today. So um, Monica, if you don't mind, I'd love to kick it over to you to start off. Um, how did you build your practice that you now have? Thanks, Jay. And thanks for, for having us. This is a lot of fun to reflect on these kinds of questions. Um, I think I, I followed my gut into uh, being a litigator. Uh, I started as I was a high school debater by accident and uh, decided that seemed kind of fun. Um, but I actually, after a year at the firm, I've been at this firm my whole career, switched over and did estate planning for a year. And, you know, so part of what I would say about following your path is that opportunities present themselves and and it's important to to take those opportunities when they interest you um and and to and to follow the things that really make you want to get out of bed in the morning this is a really hard job there are plenty of mornings none of us want to get out of bed but but in general you know there's so many areas of the law and so many types of practices that that you know be i'd say to be intentional would be to listen to your gut your core values, the things that make you, you, and, and, you know, don't be uh, oblivious to opportunities that come along that seem to, to, you know, work for you. I'd spent that year in estate planning, loved it. I loved the, it. was so gratifying to work with those clients, but it, what I discovered was a little bit of me missed the rush of the, of litigation. And so I decided with the firm's full blessing to move back into litigation 
which is a really great uh, thing because now when things are just terrible and I don't know how I'm going to get everything done, I, I look back and say, yeah, but I chose this. Um, so, so I think it, it's, it, it is a very personal decision, both from a substantive practice, but also the type of environment that you want to be in, but it's a really hard job. And so, and it's not one size fits all. So it's really just a very kind of personal finding your way. Um, but intentionally, like you said, but finding your way to the thing that, that, that makes you feel like you're doing what you want to do. Great. Um, Corey, I'd love to, to kick the same question over to you to give, give, would you mind giving our members a little bit of background on um, where, where you came from, your, how you built your practice, how you ended up where you are today? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, you know, Jay, it'd be hard to, you know, to go back and, and, and say how I got here. I, I will say that if you would have told me before I went to law school that I was going to be a property tax attorney, I probably would have gone to barber college or done something else. Kind of felt, you know, fell into it, um, you know, but actually, you know, love what I do. It's a very nuanced area of the law. Uh, that's why my best advice I would give is, you know, don't make your mind up on what type of law you want to practice. I started out doing commercial litigation. I thought I was going to do that uh, my entire career, but, you know, it did, it, you know, took a different path. Uh, I will say, you know, I, I think the best thing a young lawyer can do on, you know, finding their way, building their practice is, is, is find a great mentor. You know, that really means everything. Um, I won't get into my feelings about law school. That's a different uh, panel discussion, you know, but Abraham Lincoln didn't go to law school, right? John Marshall didn't go to law school. You know, they grew up under an apprenticeship program. You know, just, you know, find a great mentor, find leaders in your firm that are interested in your growth. You know, that's very easy to do. You know, you can go to a law firm where they want to grind 2,400 hours out of you a year. And then you go to law firms where, you know, they give you a lot of space. You know, like in my law firm, you know, we had a big issue uh, on a case we're briefing now for the Texas Supreme Court. I wanted to go one way. Uh, the lawyers in my firm wanted to go another. I got outvoted. And I was OK with that. And that's, you know, that's the path we're taking, you know. So, you know, find leaders that are interested in you growing as a lawyer, you know, growing as a um, uh, as a leader and, and as a manager eventually. Great, great. I think excellent points. The the role of mentorship, I think, is so important, um, especially through organizations like the bar, through the ends of court. Um, I think that those are invaluable resources. Barry, I'd love to to kick the same question over to you. If you can give us a little overview about how you got to be uh, how you got to be where you are now. Uh, well, I, I guess for emphasis, I'd like to start out and say that on the issue of uh, mentors and. Uh, advisors and people that further down the road than all of us, uh, the fact is uh, we need the wisdom of others and uh, none of us can go it alone. Uh, I believe in that. And there are so many people in my career that has, that I've confided in, sought their advice and counsel, asked them what I should do or not do or how to do something or not do it that uh, the list is so long, I'm not going to uh, uh, begin to try and name any particular names, but we all uh, capitalize on the experience, benefit of others. And one wonderful thing about lawyers, I've never had a, a lawyer that I've asked their opinion or their advice or for their time that has ever turned me down, not once. Um, so, uh, you know, mentors are just so important for all of us. So on, on my situation, I was lucky because, well, first of all, I've, it's almost painful to say, it, but I've been practicing law long, over 40 years now. Uh, and uh, I can't believe how quickly time's gone by. But I knew from high school that I wanted to be a trial lawyer and I wanted to be a criminal defense attorney. Uh, and that was over 40 years ago that uh, that was my goal. And now 40 years later, uh, that's what I am. And uh, if I had it to do all over again, I'd do exactly the same thing. 
it's been a terrific career that I wouldn't trade for uh, any other uh, occupation or job. So, uh, you know, it, I think it was helpful for me to know what I wanted to do. And then the question was, how do you get there? And um, so I started out in, in law school in Dallas and uh, interning at the DA's office for a couple of years uh, as a law student and then transitioned right into being an assistant district attorney and uh, worked my way up from a number three in misdemeanor court to, uh, you know, a felony prosecutor uh, and uh, left the DA's office and just started practicing back then. Uh, the way you built up uh, basically a small criminal defense practice was you took court appointed cases. And uh, I did that. Because I had that DA experience, I was uh, assigned, you know, tough, serious cases. I did that for two or three years, and, and finally I was in uh, Dallas County Jail waiting to see one of my court appointed clients. I said, I can't come back to this jail anymore. I'd been playing bar league sports. I was the DAYL softball commissioner. Uh, which basically I did the brackets and also made sure there was uh, refreshments after the games. And uh, so playing softball and flag football with other young lawyers, I met a lot of friends. Of course, the majority of them were civil attorneys. And they started sending me criminal cases. And I said, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to take any more court-appointed cases. Uh, uh, not only are these friends of mine sitting in business, but I love their company. And so I decided to, to move up at the Dow Association of Young Lawyers and then transition into being active in the Dallas Bar Association. Uh, uh, most of my business comes from referrals from other attorneys. Uh, the minority of it, or close to half, probably comes from referrals from former clients. But I got very lucky when I realized that uh, that uh, it would turn out, and it's turned out to be true, that most of the people I care about in this world are lawyers. Uh, and they were also also a source of business, a source of, uh, of being active in the Bar Association. There's the networking aspect of it, but there's also, um, you know, you, I committed to community service and service to the community. Uh, through the organization providing the vehicle that I never would have done individually. So that's basically, uh, I guess I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, encouraging people to be active in the bar because it's really been a positive um, career for me because of that involvement in large part. If y'all don't mind me going a, a little bit off of what we uh, discussed in preparation, I think it's interesting that we have this sort of theme emerging about mentoring. Um, so if, if anybody has any thoughts, I'd love to get your opinions on where you, let's say that, that I'm a young attorney at a firm and I just, for whatever reason, I can't find my direct supervisor just doesn't seem interested in mentoring. Mike, if you're watching, this isn't about you. Um, but, uh, um, but, but so hypothetically I'm at some firm and I just cannot find, I can't make that connection. Where what can I do as a young attorney to go look for somebody to to mentor me and help me develop professionally? I I agree with Barry Jay that um, there are a lot of people who will just say yes upon request, and so the best mentor relationships happen organically. But there are programs where you can sign up for a mentor through. The, the Dallas Bar Association, DAYL, through programs like We Lead um, and other programs. There are formal mentoring programs available, but, but I think the, the best ones are the ones that are organic, someone that you come to know either in your firm or, you know, I've people see somebody on a program like this and might reach out to someone and say, I, or read an article that they wrote, or maybe you've just heard of them from somebody else. But, but you know, there there are people who will just reach out and say, "Do you mind meeting me for a cup of coffee?" Um, and so, I think 
Getting involved in organizations gives you a way to meet lawyers at different seniority levels, which is great. That's taking charge of building your own career in the way Barry was described, where you just get to know people. Um, but but I think it's it's just a matter of identifying somebody that you want, that you think could have helpful guidance and then asking the question. You don't have to say, it's not like you're going to prom, right? It's, could, would you meet me for coffee? Um, and and then it goes from there. Great, great. Well, well I'll, I'll get back on the script and I'll stick to it. I just thought it was interesting that we kind of had that that theme emerge. Um, I'd love to, to turn now to once you found your niche, once you've said, you know, done your introspection, found what's going to make you happy long term in the practice of law, um, how do you start to build your clientele? Like, what do you do to first get folks in the door and then to retain them, to, to deliver the level of legal services that that makes it so that, um, all the, I guess, at least in the civil realm, that you get people coming back and back and back and back? Because I... I assume Barry probably wouldn't want to have too many repeat clients. Um, that's probably not good news in your field. Corey, I'd love to kick that over to you about um, how you start to build clientele and then how you maintain those relationships. Well, Jay, so how I, I, I started, um, you know, because in the work that we do, right, in the tax litigation field, you know, especially on the property tax side, which accounts for about 85% of what we do right across North America, you know, most states are reappraising property every year, right? So it's a great, you know, great field to be in because, right, it's an annuity, right? You're going to litigate the case every year. Well, you know, you've got clients that have been using the same litigator for 30 years. They've got a great relationship. They go to ball games together. They go to their children's birthday parties. Those, you know, those clients are hard to you know, wrestle away from that long relationship. How I did it was I told these clients that I would approach, they'd say, look, I've been using so-and-so for 25 years, you know, happy with them. I said, well, you know, give me some, you know, give me some of your terrible cases. You know, give me some, and talking to other lawyers in the firm, I'd go to them and say, hey, do you have a tough case you don't want to, you don't want to mess with? You got a difficult client, you know, like interacting uh, with and just took those really tough cases. Now, you know, working those, it's uh, it's going to be tough because you might not see some revenue coming in the door because they're likely, you know, low fee um, cases. But once you show the clients, you'll take the difficult issues. You know, they'll stay with you forever. Um, but I also say marketing plays a huge role once you get the clients and keeping them. You know, marketing really never stops. I see a lot of lawyers they'll bring in a client, assign it to, to an associate, and then they're, you know, they're kind of hands off, but, you know, you really need to keep marketing throughout that relationship, lunches, update calls, you know, and treat every client as if they're your only client. And, uh, you know, also to, you know, find out what your competitors are doing, right. And, you know, find a way to do it better than they are. You know, that's one thing that's been very successful for Ryan Law is, you know, I came from a commercial litigation background, um, you know, from a small boutique firm here in Dallas. It was very aggressive. Well, I took that mindset into tax litigation. And, you know, most, you know, tax attorneys, yeah, they're filing lawsuits, but there's not a lot of real litigating there. They file it, they go settle it. There was a lot of discovery, a lot of depositions, and we took the approach, we're going to be much more aggressive, we're going to do a lot of discovery, we're going to start, you know, fighting this out. And it was something that we got a lot of pushback from in the industry because it was something lawyers just didn't do. But it's been, um, you know, a great success for us. We just found something that the competitors weren't doing and, um, you know, focus on that. It's been a, a game changer for us. Monica, I know you have a story about um, how you kind of got started on this stuff early in your career. We'd love to to have you share that. Yeah, I listen. I never thought I would be a business developer. I I hoped I'd be a good lawyer. Figured I'd be at a firm. People bring in the matters. I'm lucky enough to have demonstrated skills, and if I'm lucky enough, things get handed to me to go do. So a lot of what I would say about this is in hindsight, um, this certainly wasn't like I, I didn't set out to build a client 
network, I, I just can look back and say that, you know, there's, there's two things you have to have to build a clientele. One is a network, uh, like Barry said, one is a network of people who know you and trust you and like you and want to support you and think you're good at what you do. Um, and the other thing is, is uh, reputation, building your reputation out in the community. You know, you want to be that person. If somebody gets a case and an email goes around their firm, does anybody know, you know, Mary Smith? And somebody says, oh my gosh, yes, I know her from this or I know her from that. Um, that's really important. For me, how it started was just working really hard to be a good lawyer and and my my first two clients that I developed were opponents in litigation where I was lucky enough as a young lawyer to get speaking time. And, you know, terrified of being made a fool, I worked really hard on those cases and got some court time. And my very first client I ever developed called me a year later from that case and said, we'd really like to hire you. And I was I was still an associate at that time. And it came from pure performance and I guess reflecting competence, which was probably born out of over-preparing because I felt, you know, I was probably outmatched. Um, but that's happened throughout my career. I've been hired by a lot of adversaries down the road. Um, but that, but but the rest of it comes from being part of a community, participating in groups like the DAYL, finding opportunities to speak, finding opportunities to build your network with your peers, which is so important as your peers, uh, all as you all grow up, you're going to be best friends and people are going to be end up in positions that you don't even know they're going to be in and in a position to, to, to maybe direct things to you. So I would really recommend just seizing on yes moments. You know, if someone says, do you want to take this hearing? Do you want to take this deposition? Do this thing as a young lawyer, do it, try it. You have to do everything for the first time and the second time and the third time. And then you're the person that's done those things. And you get the opportunity to get out and practice, really practice law as early as possible. You'll feel like you're a part of community. You'll carry yourself differently. And you and you begin to build your own stature um, out there. In terms of retaining clients, I think everyone has their own sort of you know personality, and I really believe in being true to your own self as a lawyer and not just doing what other people do. But you know, I think clients. Um, I love the comment from Corey about every, every client should feel like they're your most important client, but you need to identify with their problems. It's not, I'm speaking as a litigator, it's not your case, it's their case. You're lucky enough to have the privilege and honor to argue for them in court, but it's their case. And so seeing things through their perspective and they know you have their back and you understand them and you understand their needs and their goals um, uh, makes them feel like you're part of their team. So if you're in a type of practice where you can have repeat clients that in hindsight is how you you build those friendships, business friendships, business trust relationships with clients who know you're in it, you've got their back and uh, you'll be honest with them. And, you know, you're the person that's going to wake up at three in the morning worrying about their problem um, and trying to take that that stress off of them. Awesome. Barry, I'd love to turn over to you now. To, to talk about in this this vein of you know building these relationships in the community and the bar about the importance of having a referral network um, about you know, making relationships with other attorneys um, both to to give you work and to help uh, help them find that so so you, I think you hit on this a little bit earlier when you were talking about your experience with um, with the bar but you know the, what role does a referral network play in your practice how did you build yours we'd love to hear about it. Well, like I mentioned earlier, uh, my practice is uh, is uh, based on referrals from people that I, uh, lawyers mostly, and former clients, people I'm in relationship with. I, uh, as a you know disclosure, I'll tell you that uh, Monica uh, and her husband Richard, two of my favorite people on the planet. Uh, you know, you have to take good care of people that give you the honor of referring you business. I mean, Monica in the last year referred me a significant case of somebody that was important to her. Uh, immediately when she 
referred the case to me. I let her know how much I appreciated it, which is true. And then uh, once the case was resolved, I sent her a, a, a descriptive email explaining what happened on the case, the challenges, what the results were, and um, that I hope that she recognized that the very best possible result uh, was the one that we obtained for the person that she uh, referred to me. Um, so you have to nurture those relationships and you can do so in a meaningful way and an honest way. Uh, you, know, it, you, you know, the day of saying I'm smart, I'm pretty come to me world, uh, you know, the, that doesn't exist. Um, so you have to and keep track of the people that send you business and be thoughtful uh, for their kindness and thinking of you because there's lots of uh, people in this world that they can send uh, their uh, cases to, you know, besides me. So I uh, try and be real and I try and let the people that send me business know that how much I appreciate it. And I try and do that in a thoughtful, meaningful way. Um, and also there's been, uh, you know, corollary things I've tried to do uh, to reinforce uh, the belief that my, the people that refer me business have that I'll do a good job, uh, you know, to, to let them know uh, that I know what I'm doing. Uh, I've always tried to do as much media as I possibly could. Uh, I don't think I've ever gotten a knowing, I know I'm no, for a fact, I've got a call from somebody that said, hey, I saw you on television. But I do think, you know, every little bit helps. And if Monica wakes up and she sees me you know, on television giving my opinion about, you know, the latest legal issue, that, that may help in her mind think that maybe I know what I'm doing. So, uh, you know, and, and uh, publicity uh, uh, doesn't hurt. I've never been camera shy. I've always enjoyed the, the give and take of live television. And, and uh, it's sort of become intertwined in my criminal law practice, not only in my own cases, but uh, common cases. It's something I've enjoyed and, and hopefully it's contributed to, like I said, uh, people that think enough of me to send me business, uh, their belief that I deserve it. Great. I'd, I'd like to shift now a little away from the sort of attorney client relationship and more to the um, the management uh, component here. So Monica, I'd love to to get your thoughts on what young attorneys who are interested in firm leadership down the line can do and what you did um, to set themselves up to step into that role when at the appropriate time. Most, most senior lawyers would say, run, run for your life. Don't aspire, <laughs> don't aspire to law firm leadership. Don't aspire to law firm management. Um, and, you know, I'm not, uh, this isn't faux humility. I never in a million years set out to be the managing partner of Carrington Coleman. Wasn't even in my consciousness of an option. It, it's, it, and, you know, it's, so it wasn't really, it wasn't something that I, I aimed for, um, but, but I think building leadership skills is critically important for young lawyers um, in whatever they're going to end up doing. And so those kinds of opportunities and experiences will lead your career in a better direction, in a good direction. They'll be beneficial to you whatever that ends up looking like for you. So I would start out with, and I promise we were not asked to do this, but a plug for this organization, which I joined when I was in my first year at Carrington Coleman and was a committee chair and then ended up on the board and I was an officer and I ended up in the TYLA and the, the, um, the opportunities to see other leaders do what they do is something that's always been, I, I learned so much more from watching others than from just doing. And so studying leadership, learning leadership, um, I make more mistakes probably as a leader than I do things well, but but it's something that it's really important to be intentional about. It will help you with your practice. It will help you 
um, in your community activities, um, but, but finding leaders that are effective, that resonate with you and pay attention to how, how they do it or if there are things you might approach differently as you're in real time situations, sort of talking to yourself about how you might handle something differently or what would resonate with you personally. I think it's important to be really intentional. And I was so lucky when I was in the DAYL to watch just tremendous presidents year after year after year um, and, and to see what they did with various challenges and uh, issues that came up. Specific to my law firm, you know, I think I was a person that was always open to serve. So if the firm said we need somebody to go interview law students, I said yes. If we need somebody to go uh, pick out associate furniture, I said sure, I'll learn something about furniture. I mean, I, I do think being a receptive to opportunities uh, shows your interest in your organization, whatever it might be, and then delivering on those things, showing you're reliable and thoughtful, hopefully, and uh, on time and on budget and those kinds of things is is helpful in building the trust and confidence of the people around you. Those things will suit you whether you end up being a practice group leader or an office managing partner or a law firm managing partner or running a bunch of cases or volunteering with your kids, you know, uh, organizations. Um, I think it's I think leadership and the practice of law go completely hand in hand. And those are just the kinds of things that we should all we're never, we're, we're, I'm still learning. We're all still learning. We should always be paying attention to those things and just building, you know, building that skill set. All, all excellent points. I think that's uh, so true that leadership skills serve you wherever you end up in the, in the profession. Corey, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, uh, this same subject. What can young attorneys do and what did you do to prepare to step into a management role with your firm? Oh, which hey, I'm still preparing for that, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I guess I was lucky because when I started Ryan Law, there was just you know two of us. There was my mentor Forrest Smith, who in 2010 when we launched, she was you know Forrest was 82 years old. You know, we grew the firm very quickly, but you know, if it's me and I've got a partner who's 82, you can imagine who's doing the billing and keeping the lights on and uh, and all that. I say one thing you could do is you know, learn how things work in your firm, right? Like learn about, you know, billing, um, you know, learn the software suites that you're working with, because if that will make you a great leader, if you understand, right, what other people in the firm are doing, you know, it's like here, you know, if, you know, say we have an issue with, you know, billing and, you know, a lawyer that's never had to navigate billing, software which i tell you I, I did it for years and i screwed up every single time i touched it you know you can't appreciate you know what your billing department is going through you, if, if you've never done hr you, you don't understand what, what what they're going through um and again like monica said you know talk to your leadership you know say hey i want to be more involved um you know maybe you, know, you could attend you know management committee meeting or or you know something in the firm to start preparing for that um, and it's really a fun job, you know, most managing partners kind of rotate, you know, I made the decision years ago, was I going to continue to practice or was I going to continue to manage? I had to pick one. I knew I wasn't, I'm not smart enough to be effective at both. So I choose to just focus solely on management. Um, love it. I mean, it's got its challenges. You know, you hear these stories about, you know, management committee meetings shutting down for 12 hours because they can't decide whether to have, you know, chicken or beef at the firm holiday party. Those things happen, just something you got to manage. But um, you have to just learn as much as you can. Never stop learning. You know, they say most lawyers stop really learning what they're doing after three years. But, you know, there's lots of books out there. You know, we talked about the mentorship. You know, there's lots of attorneys that have done it that would be happy to talk to you. Great. I uh, I think we have to segue now into our ethics portion because we're about halfway through and haven't cracked the uh, haven't cracked that one open. I want to make sure that we are in our point two five that we promised our attendees. So, um, but in our ethics discussion today, we're really focusing on uh, we're, we're DAYL, we're the Association of Young Lawyers. We're focusing on issues that young lawyers might face. So, Barry, I'd love to get your thoughts on. Uh, 
Um, I am a young lawyer. Um, I'm working under a partner or maybe I have co-counsel um, who's more experienced. I'm a year or two out of law school. Um, and I get asked by this more senior attorney to do something that really doesn't fit with my understanding of my ethical duties. What would you do in this circumstance? Or what would you advise that young lawyer to do? Well, I, I think, uh, it, you know, the, the question is, it depends. Is it murky? Is it, oh, is it clear? I, I, I'd be more comfortable, Jay, addressing something that's a clear ethical or violation or legal violation that someone's asked to do uh, by a superior, if that's where it happened. And my answer is, uh, don't do it. Uh, I'll tell a quick, I'll try and be quick uh, story. When I left the district attorney's office and started my own practice, I was at a health club working out and just so happened one of the most famous Texas law, criminal lawyers ever, Richard Racehorse Haynes, uh, was work in town from Houston working out at the health club. And so, of course, then the uh, lawyers I were with, that's Racehorse Haynes. Let's, let's ask him if he wants to have, you know, and so we all sit down and he, we just started peppering the questions. He said, well, I want to tell you guys something. He said, you play it straight, practicing criminal defense law. He said, I uh, tried an income tax fraud case and I blistered uh, RS special agent on the witness stand. He said, I've been audited the last two or three years. Uh, now, whether or not, I mean, that was his conclusion that there was a direct link. Now, whether it was or not, I don't know. But uh, so the thought occurred to me, if you do something wrong, like I go into a courtroom and there's a federal agent on the stand and I've got some guilty conscience about something act I committed that I shouldn't have. And I'm worried about it. I make this agent mad that he or she is going to retaliate against me and discover something. I mean, so that whole, you know, then I can't defend my client. And so when you, when you do something, uh, either break the law or unethical, even if someone uh, superior requested you do so, you're giving your power away. And you're giving your power to someone else that now has, in essence, an opportunity that turns out to be in their interest to blackmail. Uh, and so we got in this business to you know, practice law, to be professional, to help our clients get the very best possible result. We didn't get in this law to be prosecuted or to have grievances filed against us or other people accuse, of, accuse us of misconduct. So, um, you know, the most important advice I can give a young lawyer when it comes to ethics, when it comes to following the law, is just do what is right and suffer the, any consequences from it. So if someone tells you to do something wrong or unethical, just say, I'm not going to do it and live with what happens. Because that will probably be easier than living with what could happen if you follow that kind of request and comply. So in, in terms of managing that relationship internally, let's say that you have a, this isn't a lawyer you have a standing relationship with. You're there, you're there, your direct report. Um, and they're going to, you're working with them on a series of cases. If you do end up in a situation where you have to stand your ground and just say, I'm very sorry, sir, I can't do that. Um, what, do, what do you do to manage that relationship going forward, if anything? Well, let me just say that if someone asks you to do something unethical, no matter who they are, whether they're more senior or experienced attorney, let me, and you do it, not only do you have the issues to worry about that I described a moment ago, but that person will not respect you. Uh, and after, and after, uh, you know, you have followed their direction um, and done something wrong, they will stab you in the back because they have less respect for you now, even though it was their request. So I'm um, stick by my position. Don't do it. Great, um, Corey. I'd love to get your thoughts on um, ethically gray questions. So, so you have a junior that. 
that, that thinks I'm really not totally comfortable with what my what my partner told me to do, but there's no case law saying you can't. It just doesn't jive with my personal understanding, and uh, I don't think I should do it. Uh, what what would you do in this kind of situation, sir? I, I apologize. You're on mute, sir. Happens to me about three times a day. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I would say in this law firm, you know, and I'm sure, you know, Barry and Monica would agree that, you know, nothing will seal your career in this firm. If you come into my office and say, hey, I've been asked to do something I'm unsure of. It's from a partner. It's from a practice leader. I don't want to step on anyone's toes. You know, what do you think about it? And I always tell them, as Barry said, I said, don't do it. Tell them you're not going to do it politely. And if, you know, it, you know, becomes an issue, you know, bring it to me and I'll step in, you know, because you are the only person responsible for your law license. You know, and if you, you know, if you're standing tall one day, you know, facing a grievance or, you know, malpractice claim, you can try to say, well, so-and-so partner told me to do it or, I really didn't miss this deadline. A paralegal did it. And, you know, I tried to cover it up. I was only trying to help her. That's not going to, you know, that's not going to win you any points. Um, you know, you just have to be very careful because, you know, I, I don't think anyone's going to ask you to steal something or plant a bug in a competitor's office. It's going to be something small. You know, and if you ever hear the phrase, well, everyone else is doing it, you need to run for the hills. That's the most dangerous thing I've ever heard in a firm. Um, you know, I've got a client that just got out of federal prison for star claw violations because he was doing something that everyone else in the industry is doing. He just got caught. You know, probably something small. You could probably do it a thousand times to get away with it. But the one time you get you get caught, you know, it's going to destroy your reputation. It's going to be, you know a lot of heartache. So Barry said, just, you know, don't do it. Your law license is your own and you're the only one ultimately responsible for it. Monica, I'd love to talk about um, how you handle situations where this same kind of pressure might be coming from a client. Um, so let's say that this is a major client that's important to your book of business, but they want you to do something that just, you know, makes your teeth hurt. Um, in that kind of situation, what would you advise a young attorney to do um, to hopefully maintain that client relationship while respectfully declining to uh, to take the unethical action. Yeah, there's there's two two points. Like, what is what is your answer, and how do you communicate it? Right. And so Barry is right. The answer has to be no. This profession doesn't survive if we don't adhere to the principles that we all learned in law school. We passed the professional ethics exam. Um, and we, it's, it's so important. It's also so important personally for your individual career. There's no such thing as Corey said, as like, well, somebody else did it, you know, your name's on it or associated with it. Um, it, 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 it takes a whole career to build a reputation and one bad decision to ruin it. Um, so, you know, if a client is pressuring you to do something that you're not comfortable with, whether it's flatly unethical or or not, if you're putting your name on it, um, you you it's your you ultimately are the professional who decides what to do, and you have to be willing to lose a client over it. You know, you it's and pe that's hard, it's easy to say, hard to do. You have to be willing to lose a client over it. But if you're a young lawyer, um, and you're in a firm, you have. Uh, hopefully, um, people in leadership in the firm, maybe a general counsel uh, to talk to, uh, a supervising partner um, or a law firm leader, seek those people out, even if you don't know them. If you don't think you can talk to the people that are obvious, talk to talk to someone, but, but um, don't try to just handle that with a client on your own if you're a young lawyer. Get a more senior lawyer in your camp. And if, if they're not with you, then then you just do the right thing. I'll also mention there's a state bar ethics hotline. And I just checked, you can Google state bar of Texas ethics hotline and the number pops right up. So if you want to check your math on whether something's actually unethical, there are actual, you know, ethics attorneys on standby waiting to, to help you through it. Um, in conveying things to clients, you know, I've never been asked to do something unethical, but I've been asked to 
say things that were maybe more aggressive than I would want to say or characterize someone in a way that I don't think is professional. There's a line where ethics turns into professionalism. And, I, and I'm and i just straight with clients. It's happened in the last 24 hours and someone wanted to say something really pointed because it felt good. And I said, I said, I just, that's, um, I'm not comfortable with that language. And I totally understand why you want to say it. You relate to the feelings of it, um, but this is not the place or time to do it. If you can come up with reasons why that won't be perceived well by the reader, even though it feels good, um, then then that's helpful too. But ultimately you just have to say, I've just, yeah, I would love to do what you want me to do, but I, as a professional, I have an obligation to follow my instincts. If it's not even an ethics issue, if it's ethics, then it's mandatory, but you just have to convey the sincerity that you're not just, you know, the, that you want to do what they, that they're the boss, but there are, there are lines where your judgment has to, has to supersede that. Great. Great. So, um, we're, we're winding towards the end of our time allotment, and I want to give you guys all a chance to kind of give us your last thoughts before we take questions. Um, I didn't mention this at the um, at the beginning, and I should have. If anyone in the audience has questions, please feel free to submit those through the question and answer feature on Zoom. Um, at the bottom of your screen, uh, next to the chat button is the question and answer button. It'll pop up for me, um, and we'll take those towards the end of the presentation. Um, the last thing that I'd like to, to talk with all of y'all about is to get your thoughts on um, what sort of the, uh, I guess, two, yes, sir. I'm oh, sorry, did somebody, that sounded, sounded like someone said something. Oh, okay. Zoom, my Zoom's giving me hiccups. Um, um, I, I guess I have two kind of final parting questions, which are, Number one, what are the big moments in your career that got you where, looking back, what were the big moments that got you where you are? Um, and number two, what's the advice that you would give yourself if you could go back to the year that you were Um, If you could, uh, uh, if you could go back to just after you passed the bar, what would you tell yourself about how to be an effective practitioner and how to be a good manager and how to run your practice? Uh, Barry, I'd love to start off with you if you'd like. I, Jay, I'm, I feel compelled to sort of give one of the most important things that a mentor ever told me in my practice, if not the most important, uh, uh, which is, I think, probably the most important thing I had, the gift I have to give is to pass it on to young lawyers, what was told to me. I once told a great trial lawyer uh, much older, much more successful when I was a brand new lawyer, uh, as a brand new criminal defense lawyer about to try my first serious criminal case, even though I've been a prosecutor. I, I told this uh, great lawyer that I didn't think I was smart enough to be a criminal defense lawyer. And I was about a week away from trial. It was much more difficult than being a prosecutor, uh, much less support in short. And he told me that brains are cheap. Courage makes a trial work. And um, so that's what I want to pass on today, is that to be effective, whether you're a trial lawyer or practice any other area of law, we're all smart. We all pass the bar exam. That's not easy to do, although we take it for granted. But what separates the really great lawyers is they overcome their fear with all these challenges we have in whatever area we practice in, and they act courageously um, uh, in performing their duties uh, as a lawyer representing clients. So that's the best I've got. Be courageous. Address your fear head on by acting brave. Fight the battle and don't run. Are there are there any examples you can give us of what that looks like? Like any times that you can think of that you've seen an attorney who like you looked at them and thought, wow, that was a courageous decision that that attorney made in that sort of instance? Well, most of the time in my business, I mean, most cases, criminal law places, cases are disposed of by plea agreements. And but there's some cases that need to be tried. And the most serious violation of being not courageous that I've seen uh, in my practice 
uh, by uh, witnessed in my practice is lawyers who plead their clients because they're afraid of going to trial when the best decision they could have made would have been gone to trial and fight the case in front of a jury. They decided to rush over there and do, in short, do a plea agreement that they could have done much better if they fought the case, in my opinion. Sure, sure that, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, having the resolution to say, I'm going to go put it on the line for my client to get them the best result. Um, Monica, I'd love to get your, your final thoughts. Uh, what were the big moments for you? Um, and what would your advice be on if to yourself back when you were li first licensed on how to be an effective attorney? Yeah, I agree with Barry completely. Courage, what I call yes moments, you know, seizing the opportunity to to, to do the thing, even if you're terrified um, or feel like you're not qualified. I'm not saying you should get out over your skis, but but, you know, you you can do things you don't even know you can do. Um, if I were to look back at sort of what, you know, what's like kind of the, another common theme for me in terms of how to have a, a career and to be effective throughout your career, I would say just never stop learning, never stop learning. And that includes the law that includes reading, you know, keeping up with the law in your area, which sounds so silly, but it, it's amazing how many people reach a certain point. And then have no idea that the federal rules were amended or that the Texas Supreme Court dramatically changed the law. You have to stay current. You have to stay relevant. Um, but as I mentioned before, it's learning in all ways. It's learning about leadership. It's learning about communication. Um, it's personal development. And it is self-care. And I just don't want to miss the opportunity to say, you know, it's, we sit around and say, oh, go be all the things, do all the things, be a great lawyer, take all the opportunities, be get into leadership, do DAYL, do all these things. But you have to calibrate that with your own, like having a good and healthy life, maintaining relationships with people that you love, um, having close friends that are lawyers and that are not lawyers, and making sure you make time for your own self, do things that don't involve the law, to, to, to keep you balanced and to give you that energy to, to keep doing the harder things that this job entails, because it can chew you up. It will chew all of us up at different times. It, it, if you do law right, it's hard. And so just know that going in and, and that helps with the courage, but also just never getting overconfident about, you know, you're good enough and just constantly being a learner, I think is something that you'll never regret doing. I, I think your point as to self-care is so salient, particularly in light of what we've seen in our community this year. I know DAYL has had a big focus on mental health um, and uh, taking that time for wellness is uh, life-saving in so many instances. Uh, Corey, I'd love to, to get your thoughts. What would your advice to yourself as a young lawyer be on uh, how to be an effective practitioner and manager? Oh, man, man, if I could go back, uh, probably the most important thing is, you know, get over being embarrassed when you fall flat on your face, because you're going to do that quite often. Um, you're going to sacrifice a lot in your career, most likely your dignity a lot of times, <laughs> you know, just be okay with making mistakes. You know, it's, 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 you know, mistakes are only a bad thing if you don't learn from them, you know, I, you know, Jay, I told you earlier, I think I made two mistakes before I got up this morning. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, just keep moving forward. You know, trust your instincts. They mean a lot. Trust your colleagues. Make sure you work with people that are trustworthy and, you know, be trustworthy yourself. You know, because you can spend a lot of time building up a reputation. It can get destroyed in a matter of, of minutes. And, you know, as you know, Barry said, be courageous. I'd also say put in the work. Elbow grease goes a long, long way. Because, yeah, you know, wooden brains that got me to where I'm at today. I promise you that. So you know, I think. Uh, oh, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt, sir. Um, but I think the, the question, the point you raise about making mistakes is is interesting. Uh, interesting. And I know that when I was young, well, not that I'm not a, still a recently licensed, but when I was fresh out of law school, they just handed me my license. I was petrified to tell any of my partners that I had erred. 
Um, would, would any of you have advice for young lawyers who are in a position where they might be tempted to try to sweep something under the rug? I do. There are very few things that can't be fixed if you fess up to it right away. Very, very few things. And um, Judge Lynn, Barbara Lynn was my first boss. She was at the firm when I joined the firm and that's what she told me on my first day. And I made so many mistakes uh, in that first year uh, and, and since to Corey's point, but you have to go talk to somebody if you make a mistake. Um, and, and, and you might think it's, it's, it, it's the end of your career and the kinds of things that felt that way to me in my first year, I just look back and laugh. Um, they're fixable and, but, but really bad things happen when you don't. So you just, just got to attack it and come up with, come up with the action plan. So one last thing that I know, um, so we've got a little bit of extra time here. Uh, one thing that we've been hearing from recently as an organization, DAYL, um, our executive director, our executive director was mentioning that she's been hearing from partners about, um, in the context of maintaining client relationships, like we were discussing earlier, the importance of communication um, and being responsive. What role does that play for you guys in um, in your practices? Well, I think if if a client contacts me, uh, firstly wanting to know an update on their case, I consider that to be a mistake on my part. I like being out in front with my clients and keeping them informed as to where we are and what's going on before they contact me, like I just said. So good communication with your client is essential and they deserve to be well informed about the status and progress of their case. And so it's easy to do. It doesn't take that long uh, to keep them well informed. Uh, and uh, so stay out in front of that. That's my advice. Great. Well, thank you guys again so much for joining us today. Um, it is it's so important for us to have attorneys like you who are willing to come in and donate your time to educate our members. I know that it means a lot to our membership, um, and you don't have to be here, and we're not paying you for it. So I uh, appreciate the fact that you made the time. Um for um, for our attendees, the uh, course number has been posted um, in the webinar chat. Please make sure that you write that down um, and you go ahead and you self-report that. And thank you guys again so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. I think it was a very insightful conversation, and I'm sure that our members took away a lot from it. Thank you guys so much for being here and for uh, sharing your time and your expertise with us. Thanks, Jay. Thank it was you. fun. Appreciate it.